All right, good afternoon, folks. And uh, thank you for joining us for this program this afternoon. This is the um, really sort of our second COIL annual uh, research symposium, if you will. And we have, we're really excited to have uh, our guest speaker you'll meet in a couple minutes. And uh, as well as after the COIL Fisher talk this afternoon, we'll have the, the RIG showcase, or the Research Initiation Grant Showcase, which will be happening from 3 to 5. So it's going to be a pretty full day, but we've got, we've got some great stuff for you. So uh, it's one of the things we're trying to do in COIL is to make sure we reach out to our community and get you connected in and sort of get you as the, uh, as the face of the organization. So it's my pleasure this afternoon to introduce John Shank. I know many of you know John. John's the head librarian at the Berks campus. Uh, he always has his pulse on noon emerging uh, theories and pedagogies and technologies. I happen to remember that open educational resources was one of his passions. And I thought, hey, what a great way to involve John in this program as well. And he's going to do an introduction for us. So John, just in one second, before I, I leave the mic, though, I just want to mention any questions you might have uh, at the at, after uh, Cable's talk, you're going to need to get to a mic. We'll have two mic runners. I'll be one. And Megan McDonald, or yeah, Megan's going to be the other one. OK? So John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us today, John. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Larry. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. K uh, Cable Green, who is the current Director of Global Learning at the Creative Commons. And I've had the pleasure of being able to watch some of his presentations over the past years. And he is one of the leading authorities on open educational resources and the ways in which they can be used to educate the world. So with that, it's my pleasure to go ahead and welcome Cable. And I'll turn the floor over to you. All right, thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Working? Okay, good. So uh, first, does anybody tweet? Anybody have a phone in their pocket? They tweet? Okay, so uh, here's my Twitter handle. I'm at C Green. Uh, so if, if, uh, if you like what we're talking about today, uh, I think my mic's a little hot. Somebody might want to bring that down just a touch. Um, if you like what we're talking about today and you want to follow what I'm working on, this is a good way just to see what I'm working on, what, what, who I'm talking to. Uh, resources that I share tend to come here first. Uh, and second, uh, for today's talk, uh, this is a good way, if, if there's questions that you don't get answered or you want to talk more, uh, just send me a tweet or you can send me an email, either one, and we can follow up after. Uh, so there's, there's my email, that's how you get in touch with me. So we'll talk about a lot of things uh, today. Um, I, as was said, I, I lead our education efforts at Creative Commons, so you'll, you'll learn what that is. We're going to talk about OER, we're going to talk about what's happening in uh, policy and what uh, what's happening around funding around the world in terms of funding educational resources, uh, academic research, and how open is affecting that. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, what's happening for the, the business case of OER. We'll talk about what faculty are doing, what students are doing, uh, et cetera. And then uh, your conversations will, will take us in different directions as well, or your questions. Uh, of course, all of these uh, slides are, are openly licensed and, uh, and freely available. You can use them any way you want, so no need to take notes. Uh, the, the organizers here have a copy of my slides, and they'll uh, make sure they're up on the COIL website, and you can download them and use them however you'd like. The only requirement is that you need to provide attribution. So we'll get to that in a little bit. So I always like to start with, um, you know, what, why are we having this conversation? So the conversations we've been having so far today, people have been asking me questions like, you know, what do you think is going to happen with education in the next three to five years? What are the trends we should be paying attention to? Uh, what what is it going to mean to publish uh, an academic or research article in the coming years? How is that changing? What are we going to do about student data? How do we use data analytics to help uh, improve the curriculum that students have access to, to provide customized personal learning pathways, et cetera? And these are all really important conversations, and we'll get there. But I always like to start the conversation with this question. Uh, why are we at Penn State University? Why do you, for those of you who are faculty, staff, administrators, why did you choose to work in education. And I've also chosen to dedicate my career to education. And usually when I ask that question, there's kind of a common set of responses to that. People say, well, I, I think education's a good thing. I think that when people have an education, that's good for the individual, it's good for people's families, it helps them get better jobs, they can make more money over a lifetime, leads to better lives, it leads to better citizens, it's good for liberal democracies, it creates more peaceful societies, it's a more interesting life to lead, lead and a more fulfilled life. There's all sorts of reasons why 
it's important to help people get an education. Um, it helps people see the perspectives of others. You know, we, we have these, uh, these progressive hopes around why people have an education. So why are we educators? Well, uh, because we want everybody in the world to be able to get an education if that's something that they choose to do. And what I hope to persuade you by, uh, by the end of the day is that, or by the end of this uh, hour and a half, is that we have a set of tools available to us today as educators that we did not have available to us even 10 or 15 years ago. And those tools are, we've got this crazy thing called the internet, which lets us move a knowledge and in an abundant fashion around the planet at near speeds of light. That's an interesting change in, in, uh, in human evolution. Uh, we also, what we use in education, and this is true of almost out of every other industry, what we use in education today is digital. And so the, the content we use in the class, the textbooks that are produced, the academic research articles, the data that you do in your research, uh, the student services we provide, more and more what we provide is digital. Doesn't mean we don't have face-to-face, -face, doesn't mean that's not important, we do, and I'm not uh, up here advocating for online learning, that's a separate conversation. Uh, but what I mean is the, the products, the, the artifacts that we use in education have gone digital and they'll never go back. Right? You all remember uh, mimeograph machines and making copies for everybody and right, all that. we don't do that stuff anymore, right? There is no more analog tape. Everything is digital. You want to record what these folks are doing when they're recording the audio and the video, it's all digital, it always will be. But probably there'll be better ways to do digital in the future, but we're not going to go back to analog. The reason that that's important is that digital things have a unique set of characteristics that non-digital things don't. Digital things can, because of uh, because of cloud computing, because of the falling cost of disk space and computers, because of the net, we can store, replicate, and distribute digital things at near zero costs. So let's think about that for a minute. Think about the traditional supply chains of, uh, let's, let's stick with textbooks as an example. It used to be 20 years ago, if you wanted to build and distribute and sell textbooks, that was a very, very expensive proposition. Still is, by the way. But the supply chain was very expensive. It was, it's one set of costs to write the book and edit it and everything and get it just in the right format. That's very expensive. That's still expensive. Those production costs have not gone away. It's also expensive to maintain an educational resource, keep it up to date, to make sure it's accurate, uh, et cetera. That's still expensive as well. But the rest of the parts of the supply chain have fallen to zero. So the cost of storage, how much does it cost to store a 300-page textbook on a computer? Almost nothing. Right? All of your computers, I see a lot of computers in the room, you could store probably millions of textbooks on that Mac laptop and it wouldn't cost you a penny more to do it. Right? So storage has fallen to zero. How much does it cost to distribute a file that's sitting on his computer right there to everybody else in the world over the internet? Almost zero. The cost is, I'll show you some costs in a minute, but it's very, very close to zero. And how much does it cost to, uh, to, make, to make copies? If I wanted to share with all of you a copy of this PowerPoint slide deck, how much does it cost me to make a copy? Nothing, right? So that's interesting when we're thinking about education. If the goal, if part of what we do in education is we want all learners around the planet to have access to high quality educational resources. When I say resources, I'm talking about textbooks, curriculum, academic research, the data that goes along with that, et cetera. If we can store, distribute, and make copies of digital things for near zero cost, what do we do with those tools as educators? That's the question in front of us. Okay, I've chosen to say, uh, you know, my particular dream is to use educational resource, digital educational resources and open them, and we'll talk about what that means, so that everybody in the world can attain all the education they desire. So first, let's talk about some of the, the context within which we're having this conversation. What are the trends? So I, I travel around the world, um, uh, I don't know where I am next week, actually. <laughs> Wales, I think. Um, but one of the trends is that demand for higher education continues to go up. Uh, I don't know who picked up uh, USA Today or the Wall Street Journal yesterday, but the US Department of Labor just put out uh, where the jobs are going to be in the future. And number one was post-secondary education. That's the number one job growth area over the next five years. Right? Maybe surprising to us in the room, but that's, that's what labor is predicting. Uh, in this country, this is true in many other countries as well. And the reason for that is there are more and more students globally coming out of a United Nations 20-year effort to have universal primary education, 
for everybody on the planet. That's been a very successful initiative. Those people are now coming into secondary and post-secondary education, and we don't have enough room for them. So as big as Penn State is, I went to Ohio State. As Ohio State has 52,000 students right on their Columbus campus. These are big universities. They pale in comparison to the demand that's out there. So read this, right? I think you had John Daniel here as one of your speakers for a, a coil speaker. This is one of John's quotes that I like to talk about. As you read this, what do you think the odds are that the world is going to build four major universities that serve 30,000 students apiece to open every week for the next 15 years? Because that's what it's going to take to meet the existing demand for post-secondary ed, not to mention what's coming. So we're simply ill-equipped if we think that our traditional brick and mortar structures are going to be able to meet the needs of the global demand for higher education. It's, it's not in the cards. We're going to have to come up with something different. Part of that is probably open educational resources. Part of it is online learning. Some of it might be something like MOOCs and badges. We don't know. It's a very chaotic space right now. But what we do know is there are a lot of people on the planet that want to go into higher education that, that can't get it for cost reasons, other access reasons, geographic reasons, technology reasons, et cetera. Problem that needs to be solved. Second big context, and I'm going to come back to the United States for a minute. Student debt continues to go up every year. So the, student, the new average debt of students coming out of Penn State or any other university in this country from a bachelor's degree is now closing in on $27,000 in debt. Okay, that's not a ton of money. And we know that that's, it's worth it to, to invest in your own education. We know that if you have a degree, especially advanced degrees, your unemployment uh, percentage is much, much lower during recessions compared to people that have a high school diploma. We know that you can't get by in this world with a high school diploma anymore. You have to have some post-secondary yet if you want a good job. But the problem is, because uh, student debt continues to go up, uh, there's also this question uh, in the public about perceived value. I'll come to that in a minute. First, I think everybody knows student debt last year in the US passed $1 trillion. And it's climbing fast. It's passed, I think, 1.1 or 1.2 trillion now. That's more than all of the consumer debt in the United States of America. So if you totaled up all of our credit card bills in the US and how much we owe credit card companies, that pales in, that's like 800 billion, something like that. Student debt is, is more. And what's more is student debt cannot be dispelled in, or gotten rid of in bankruptcy quickly. Uh, you can get rid of almost every other debt, mortgages and, and credit card debt and bankruptcy, but you can't get rid of student debt through some very crafty lobbying by people that hold student debt. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, our students are saddled with it. Now, if you go through a master's or a PhD or another professional degree, your debt gets hit very quickly up into hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you've seen students that this is happening. So, so this, is a, this is a challenge. Uh, this is something that we need to pay attention to. And affordability of a higher education is being, um, is being looked at carefully. I don't know if you've seen, but Tennessee is offering its citizens free community college tuition now. It's a new program they just started. And they, were, they thought they were going to get 10,000 applicants. They got 30,000 in the first couple of years. So there's a real demand out there. Second is the public, really for the first time since the end of World War II, in the United States is questioning whether or not college is quote unquote worth it, right? Is it worth it, my family investment? Is it worth taking out a second mortgage on my home? Is it worth working two jobs to send my child to college? Now we know the answer to that question is yes, it absolutely is worth it. But the problem is, is that in 2008 when our economy tanked, home prices tanked as well. I don't know about all of you, but my mortgage was upside down for a period of time where I owed more on the mortgage than I could have sold my home for, I was thankful that I wasn't trying to send my kids to college because the way that most middle class Americans send their kids to college is by taking out home equity loans or mortgages on their home. And if you don't have equity in, the, in your home, there's no equity to tap to send your kids to college and then you can't afford to send your kids to college. Okay, and this is, a, this is a real challenge. And so, um, so this is something, this is part of the narrative that's out there that we need to address. And so governors and legislatures and universities are trying to figure out how do you get to more affordable degrees for students. Lots of ways to do that, but it's a contextual element to this conversation. Next thing is, is the affordances of digital things. So we talked a little bit about this. Um, and when I said it costs zero to share, copy, and distribute, here's what I mean. So here's a, if you take a 250-page textbook, there's other things you can do to it which are very expensive and I wouldn't recommend. Here's how much it costs to copy that textbook by computer. So 0. 0.00084 cents. Is it, is it zero? No. How many students do you have here at Penn State? About 
about 90 in the system. So somebody whip out their cell phone because it's got a calculator on it. Uh, I'll task you to do this. You have a cell phone in your pocket? So multiply 90,000 by 0 0.00084, three zeros, and tell me what to get. Okay, and then here's what the cost of distribution looks like. Here's the number you want to be paying attention to. Right, so yes, it's very expensive to create those really great textbooks, that great uh, academic research, that great set of instructional materials. Uh, but how, once it's built, how much does it cost to share it with everybody else? Almost. Okay, so that's the important point. And another important point is, so this is our question, right? What do we do with those tools? Another important point, and this is true, what, what's the number? $72. Anybody have $72 they could spare? We could buy a textbook for every single student in the entire uh, Penn State system for calculus. Right. Those, are the, those are the economic realities in front of us. Uh, I can guarantee you that that's not what's happening at Penn State, but probably, um, and you should go run these numbers, by the way, you should ask your, uh, your folks at the university who have all the data to run an enrollment of the top 250 courses at Penn State and line them up by enrollment and then look at what the average cost of the textbooks are for those highest enrolled classes and then multiply it out. I'll show you some stats from uh, a system that I used to work in. Uh, but if you've got 90,000 students in the system, um, just running the numbers in my head here, you probably, your highest enrolled courses are probably in the 10, 15,000 enrollments in terms of total number of students that take your basic writing courses and your, uh, you know, your basic math courses, et cetera, your 100 level courses at the university. And they're probably spending tens of millions of dollars a year on textbooks for just one course at the university. It's something that you ought to look at if you're concerned about affordability of going to Penn State. And I'll show you some resources you can look at. Another important point is that higher education is uh, perpetually behind other industries in the strategic use of data and technology. Uh, and this is, uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing. We tend to watch other industries and then we don't make the same mistakes that they do. We're also the academy. We're in this for the long term. This is not a short term play that we're making with people's lives and education. And so we're very cautious and we move slowly and we investigate things and we're thoughtful as we make changes and do research. But nevertheless, um, we have fundamentally not been, uh, we have not taken advantage of the efficiencies, uh, not only the economic efficiencies um, and the tactical efficiencies of, of digital technologies, but we also haven't changed our are teaching and assignments to leverage what you can do with open digital content. So I'll come back to this later, but for example, when I was going to college, I would go into a class, I would get the syllabus, they would say, here's what your grade is based on. I would get assignments, I would fill out those assignments, turn them into my faculty member, the faculty member would grade them, and then they would hand me back to them with a grade, and I would throw the assignment away, the professor would throw the assignment away, I would graduate from the class, I'd go to my next class. My guess is that's a lot of what happens here at Penn State. What's starting to happen now with, because, because we have digital stuff and because there are open licenses on this stuff, is faculty are saying to their students, no more throwaway assignments. Here is your assignment, and your assignment is actually to rewrite chapter two of the textbook we're using because this is a political science textbook, and chapter two is all about uh, the change of Russia as it moved from USSR and went through Glasnost, and it just so happens that our textbook doesn't include anything about the latest conquering of Crimea and the changing of Ukraine's borders and the new power struggles that are happening and why Russia is doing this because half of its economy is based on petroleum. And we need that in our educational resource. And Larry, as a student in this political science class, your job is to go out and research that and go down and work with the library and figure out and read original sources and cite those and make chapter two up to date and better than it is today. Now, if Larry's a student in my class, that is a much more interesting assignment then spit back to me what's in the book, or even just do interesting stuff, but only me and the professor get to see it. It's much more interesting if I say to Larry, Larry, you're actually gonna improve this class, and I saddle you with that responsibility. And not only are your colleagues and future cohorts of students gonna be affected by the changes that you make to this open content, but I'm gonna share this open textbook with everybody else on the planet. And so you better do good work. It really changes the equation in how students are thinking about their contribution. So, so back to this, has anybody subscribed to any of these services? Right, Hulu, and so, so these is a pretty good deal, right? You kind of get access to all of the media that you could possibly consume, and let's be honest, more than you should be consuming uh, for about eight bucks a month. Uh, anybody do any of these music services, Spotify or 
you haven't seen Spotify, you got to check it out. It's un unbelievable. Uh, and it's free on your desktop, but if you want on your mobile phone and get all their bells and whistles, it's about 10 bucks a month. So, you know, think about what the music industry used to do in terms of content. Very, very expensive, expensive distribution. If you wanted music, you had to buy the whole CD. The new model is you pay less than you would for one CD or one tape or one LP, and you get access to 15 million songs. And every time a new album comes out, it's kind of automatically on Spotify or Rhapsody or whatever service. Um, it's a different model, right? It's a radically different set of access for a much lower price point. So to put this in perspective, for $20 a month today, you can get access to kind of all of the music on the planet, plus all of the, uh, and this is very US-centric view, but all of the movies and media that are coming out of Hollywood and the cable networks, et cetera. For $20 a month, you can have all that, or you can lease, Lease, not buy, lease access to a textbook for one month. Okay, so I ask you which industries have been you know, disrupted by digital technologies and, and new models? It's not us. Now, faculty in the room, put your hands up. Sorry. Okay, so faculty, this should scare the hell out of you because what this model says is your students only have access to the educational resources in your course as long as they pay a lease fee for access to that content. At the end of the semester, when they stop paying their $20 a month, poof, there's a time bomb on these things and their access goes away. So if you believe that educated people, learners, should have perpetual access to the educational resources that they're using, which is something that I believe, and, and uh, the librarian and I were talking as we were walking over that we no longer live in an age of scarcity. We live in an age of abundance. And so the idea of adding artificial scarcity onto a digital resource that could be shared at the marginal cost of zero is a way of protecting existing business models and not a way to maximize access to education resources. And so you ought to be very, very cautious of models like this as they come at Penn State. And they're already here, and they'll be coming at you fast. OK, so we've been beating around the bush of OER. Let's dive right into it. And what are we talking about? Uh, so first of all, I've talked about digital stuff, but I haven't talked about the legal side before. So this is where I work. I work at Creative Commons. We're a nonprofit organization. Uh, we produce the open copyright licenses that everybody on the planet uses to share educational resources, scientific literature, uh, public sector government data, uh, libraries and museums share licenses to share images of their artwork. Libraries use our, our CC0 protocols to put their metadata about all their library holdings into the public domain. Stuff that's in the public domain is being marked with our public domain mark so that you can actually find it and make use of it. Uh, we're 10 years old. We operate worldwide. We've got teams in 75 countries around the world. And our team, our headquarters team, is scattered all around the planet as well. So, so what is CC and why, why do we need it? Why is this an important thing? Well. First, there's, there's copyright, and there's stuff in the public domain. And for things to get in the public domain in the United States, um, they have to be, first, the author has to die, and second, 70 years have to pass. It even works if you're in Mexico. You have to die first, and then 100 years have to go by. So for things to get in the public domain, it takes a long time. And in education, what we care about is I need access to that resource. I need the legal rights, so nobody's going to sue me that I can bring that resource into my class and modify it to meet the needs of my students. Right? That's what I need to be able to do. So if you're waiting for stuff to go into the public domain, you're going to be waiting a while. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's good when things go into the public domain, but it takes a long time. Over here, you've got all rights reserved copyright. Nothing wrong with copyright. When people build something, their rights should be protected. That's a good thing. The question a decade ago when the internet really took off and digital computing took off and cost of computers started to fall, was there were people all around the planet, musicians, filmmakers, educators, scientists, who said, yes, I hold the copyright, and I don't have my own personal attorney. Are there any lawyers in the room? Good, let's make fun of lawyers. So right, lawyers, are, they tend to be expensive, and they tend to slow things down, and it takes time. Right? But, but, but law is important. We want to follow the law. We don't want to be breaking the law. And if I took somebody's all rights reserved content without legal permission, or if I'm not using it under fair use guidelines, I'm breaking the law. So if I go to Ohio State's website today, and if it says all rights reserved, copyright, Ohio State University, and I start downloading their courses, uh, maybe I'm covered under fair use. Probably not. 
uh, and I start using it at Penn State, I'm, I'm, I'm in violation of US copyright law, and for each infraction, I could be hit with a quarter million dollar fine. Not something I want to be doing at Penn State. Right, so the problem was there was no in-between. Right, so what Creative Commons is, is this in-between. It's this some rights reserve. So we say, yeah, public domain's great. Takes a long time to get stuff there. Nothing wrong with copyright. You want to keep your ownership and not share? That's your choice. You could do that. The law protects that. But what if you want to share? What if you want to keep your copyright and give some rights and permissions to everybody else on the planet? That's what Creative Commons license is. So by the way, this is all free. It doesn't cost any money. People say, well, that can't be true. How are you funded? You know, who pays your salary? The, the answer is uh, foundations just give us money because they're glad that we exist because we make sharing simple and legal around the planet. So they just give us general operating funds. Our whole budget, by the way, at Creative Commons is only about $5 million. So uh, that's probably less than one of your departments here at, at Penn State. Right? We're, we're very, very, very uh, small, but we've got uh, volunteers, about 400 of them that are active around the world in 75 countries. And these people care about this. Stuff, so they do it. The lawyers that help us write the licenses and translate them into different languages around the world do it pro bono. Right? So there's a collective global effort around this. Uh, and we've been around 10 years, and we're not going away. All these licenses, by the way, we've dedicated to the public domain. So if Creative Commons ever did go away for some reason, this stuff lives forever. Right? It'll never be taken away from the world. Uh, so when you get a CC license, first of all, you keep your copyright. You should never give up your copyright to, to somebody else. Uh, and you've got choices. All of our licenses require attribution. That means that if somebody uses your stuff, they have to give you credit. They have to say, you're the author. Here's a link to your work. It's a way to drive traffic back to you. It's recognition. It's a citation. They're citing. Uh, share alike, so, so that one's required. The other three are optional. Share alike means if they take your work and they modify it, they change it, they make a derivative work, they must share that new changed work under the same terms that you shared your work under. This is what Wikipedia uses. So Wikipedia has an attribution share alike article on every single article on Wikipedia. So when you change something on Wikipedia, what you're agreeing to, per the CC license, is that your changes are licensed under the same terms as every other Wikipedia article. Okay. Non-commercial means you can use my work, you can make copies of it, you can distribute it, but you can't sell it. So here's my textbook, I'll share it with you, but it's got an attribution, non-commercial uh, license on it. I don't want to see my work up on your website for 1995. That would be violating the non-commercial license. And the last one, no derivatives, is um, you can use my work, but you can't change it. Now in education, we try really hard to stay away from the last two. So by the way, when you mix and match these different licenses, you get one of these six different Creative Commons licenses. So when somebody says CC BY, that's what they're talking about. It's the Creative Commons attribution license. BY SA is attribution share alike. BY NCND would be attribution non-commercial, uh, no derivatives. Now in education, we look at it like this. And when I say least free to most free, there's no cost to the licenses. They're all free in terms of cost. I mean degrees of freedom. How much freedom, how much flexibility are you giving to the public to do things with your work? So obviously the most freedom you can give people is to put your work directly in the public domain because there's not even an attribution requirement then. And we have something called CC0, which lets you dedicate your work, give up your copyright, put it right in the public domain. This is very popular for data, okay, not so much for content. Content, people usually want to keep the copyright, put a license. So then you sort of start at the top. Attribution, attribution share alike, and you come down. Any of these down to here are considered acceptable OER licenses, although the preferred OER licenses are up toward the top. And the main reason is the more restrictions you put on others, the less use there will be of your work. Does that make sense? So we were talking today, and where's the, who's doing the move? Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Who else is doing a MOOC? You guys are. All right. So are you on the epi epidemiology MOOC? Which one? MAPS MOOC. Okay. So, um, so you know, MOOCs are a great example. A part of the reason why people put MOOCs up is they do want to share broadly. Uh, part of the reason is um, you know, it's good advertising for the university. It's good advertising for the faculty member. But mostly it's about sharing, right? I got this really great content. I want to share it with a whole bunch of people, many more than I ever could probably teach in my career. So it's kind of exciting. Um, most MOOCs that are out there are all rights reserved copyright. 
And so if I'm, so I live in Olympia, Washington, if I'm a professor at Evergreen State College in Olympia and I see his map, maps MOOC and I say, wow, this is really great and I want to use parts of this in my class, it's actually against US copyright law for me to go in and start downloading parts of his course and use the parts of the course or the whole course at Evergreen State College. Now, that he, he might, what's your name? Anthony might say, well, gosh, that's not, was, wasn't my intention. I actually want people to use my course. Well, then what he, what he should do is put a Creative Commons license on his MOOC and say, unless otherwise noted, everything in this course is under a CC BY license or a BY SA license. But he'll choose the license that he's comfortable with, and he's going to keep the copyright. He's signaling to the rest of the world what terms they can use his work under. And the beauty of Creative Commons licenses is now he's given a priori permission to the planet to use his work under the terms that he selected. Nobody has to call him. Nobody has to email him. We don't need any lawyers involved. He's protected by the full force of US copyright law around the planet. Okay. And all he had to do was go grab a CC license and stick it on his book, which I'll convince him to do later. Oh, of course. So let's talk about that. So actually, you can just do it. So let me, um, today seems to be pick on Coursera day, but let me, uh, so Michigan. Let me show you what Michigan does. Michigan Coursera. Here we go. So here's, here's a course that Michigan has up on Coursera. It's literally this simple. So this is in Instructional Methods health professionals. So here's their landing page, right? We've all seen these on Coursera. If I scroll down, I'll make it bigger when I find it here. Blah, blah, blah. It says FAQ. Can I use materials from this course? Yes. Unless otherwise noted, material from this course is made available under the terms of a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 license. This is not up to Coursera. This is your choice. You're the copyright holder. You built the content. They are just a platform. They're a really good advertiser, but it's not their choice. It's your choice. If you want to put a CC license on it and share, you just do that. You slap it right on your homepage. You say, unless otherwise noted, everything in this course is under this license. And that's all there is to it. It's that simple. Coursera says you can't do that, which they won't, by the way, because everybody else is doing this, like what Michigan does. Um, and you just say, fine, I'll put my course somewhere else. And they'll say, oh, wait, we were kidding. You can, you're the copyright holder. You can do what you want to do. Right? It's not their call. Does that help? Yeah. OK, good. We can talk more if need be. Come back here. OK, so lots and lots of examples. Right, Everything on Wikipedia is under a CC license. Uh, Flickr, anybody use Flickr to find images? So go to, go to Google and type in Flickr Creative Commons or Flickr Commons. And what you'll find is a page like this that uh, they, they, uh, they mark out where their images are that have CC licenses, or even better, go to Flickr and just search for whatever it is you're looking for, and then click on Advanced Search, and you can filter your search by Creative Commons license. And that way you know that whatever you're downloading, you actually have the legal rights to use, which is important. Again, every copyright infraction can be up to a quarter million, each one. So each image you pull, faculty, and you're putting in your slide deck, if you don't have the legal rights to use it. Now, you might be able to use them under fair use provisions, and your libraries can advise you on that, and your legal staff can advise you on that, and that's, you should. You should exercise those fair use rights. But for an example, if a faculty member, and I know that no faculty at Penn State ever do this, but if a faculty member downloaded 10 images from Flickr that were all rights reserved copyright, and you use them in your course year after year after year, you're no longer covered by fair use. Right? You violated some of the provisions inside fair use. You, you need to be using things that are under an open license. So one of the things that you should think about as faculty is not only there's a bunch of open content out there in the world. So for example, there's 320 million images in Flickr that have Creative Commons licenses on them. Okay, there's there's uh, 200 or so universities around the world that are sharing their curriculum under Creative Commons licenses. In some cases, the whole university, like MIT. In some cases, just a university department, like the chemistry department at, where is it? Not Yale, um, UC Irvine Chemistry just opened up all of its chemistry courses under CC license. Uh, and sometimes it's an individual faculty member, like my, my new friend over here who's going to put a CC license on his MOOC. Um, 
But if you are taking something with a CC license, you as faculty know a couple things. One, nobody's going to sue you because you have legal rights to use it. Two, you have the legal rights to modify it to meet your needs, which is really important. You don't have those rights with commercial all rights reserved content. And three, you can keep it forever, and so can your students. Nobody will ever come in and take it away from you. And that's important, too, because as we said, the new commercial textbook publisher model is to lease it for a short period of time and then take it away from you and take it away from your students. And I would argue that's probably not a good thing. Okay, any physicists in the room? No? Nope. So CERN, you all know the super collider, right? They're figuring out how the universe works, important stuff. Uh, the physicists who work here you are saying, look, uh, this is important information. We're collecting uh, you know, terabytes of data daily. And we have, yes, we have a lot of smart people who work at CERN. But we don't have all the smart physicists on the planet. And so as they're collecting data, videos, their, you know, their white papers, they're putting out under Creative Commons licenses. They want to get them out there so the scientific community can chew on the stuff immediately and, and continue to work collaboratively. This happens in music. It happens in journalism and broadcast news. Happens in publishing, including in academic journals like Public Library of Science. And if you want to see a list, there's like, I don't know, 9,600 uh, open access journals now. Go to DOAJ, Directory of uh, Open Access Journals, uh, to check that out. Uh, uh, we talked about uh, libraries. There's a big project in Europe called Europeana, uh, where they take their metadata uh, of the library works and they put those under CC0. Um, more and more examples. All the blogs, anything, if you ever go uh, to the White House website and you do any of their petitions or blogs or ask Congress to do things, all your contributions are under a CC BY license. That's part of their terms of service. Um, we talked about higher ed. This is happening all over the world. There's just, if you go to the Open Education Network's website, you'll find thousands of courses that universities have put CC licenses on. It's happening in primary education, not just in the US. But around the world, one of my favorite examples is uh, we've got a team in Poland. And our team in Poland is in Warsaw. And a couple of the staff work in the president's office. And in Poland, up until last year, parents had to buy their kids K-12 textbooks. The net result of that, and textbooks are expensive in Poland just like they're expensive here. The net result of that national policy is that half the Polish school kids didn't have textbooks. So think about it. Anybody have kids? Right? So I have two boys, uh, nine and six. They're in grade school. They're, we live in the United States. In the United States, it's standard that the state, we taxpayers, pay for textbooks. Every kid has educational research. Not the case in Poland. In Poland, the parents have to buy it. If you don't have money, if you're a janitor in the local university, um, you've got a choice. You can either uh, rent an apartment and put a roof over your kid's head, or you can buy second grade textbooks this year. But you can't do both because those two things cost about the same thing. What are you going to do? You're probably going to put a roof over your kid's head, right? So the net result is half the kids in Poland, no textbook. Is that a national problem? National problem. Right? How easy is that to fix? Really easy to fix. Right? They actually, for about $15 million a year, which for Poland, for the national budget, is a rounding error, you know, several decimal places down. Uh, it's, you're just not talking about very much money. Uh, they put out competitive grants, even to for-profit companies, and said, hey, publishers of Europe, we'd love for you to create new textbooks for us. Up to date, digital, five digital versions. We want print on demand in case kids want print. We want them to work on every digital device. Uh, and by the way, um, the copyright will be held by the government uh, because the government, the people of Poland are paying. This is taxpayer money paying for these things. And the government's going to put a Creative Commons attribution license on all the books. And we're going to give them away to the parents. Now, if the school districts don't like, like the books that are produced, that's OK. They can go back to the old model and half the kids don't have books. That's their choice. Local control reigns supreme, and we'll let the local parents talk to their school boards about what they want to do. But there will be an option so that every kid can have a book for every single subject in Poland. Right? For 15 million years, they sold the book. Okay, so, uh, this is also happening uh, in the United States. Uh, in, in my state, we've got a big project. Utah's got a massive project. Uh, Utah started out. Uh, with uh, chemistry textbooks with nine teachers in the Provo School District, just south of Salt Lake City. Nine teachers. Uh, the teachers took an open textbook uh, from CK-12. They revised it. It was a chemistry book. They spent about a week, about, about nine teachers, gave them some laptops, put them in a hotel, let them revise the book. They used it. They were thrilled. They owned it, right? They, the teachers, the educators, had 
changed it. They modified it to meet their students' needs. They updated it. They put in new examples. They're really excited. That enthusiasm spread to their students. Guess what? Their students uh, beat everybody else on the standardized test for chemistry in the district. The district said, huh, that's interesting. So they took the open textbook district-wide, and the district beat everybody else in the state. That caught the state's attention. And now this fall, or last fall, 70, 80,000 students in Utah are all using that open textbook. Uh, it's one of the few up-to-date textbooks that are circulating in Utah, right? Because the commercial textbooks that are bought, school districts keep them for a decade because they're expensive and you've got to amortize the cost over 10 years to make the money make sense. Okay, so open educational resources. Let's get specific. What do we mean? This is the Hewlett definition of OER. This is what most people around the world use. There's two important aspects to it. It's all the stuff we use in education, that's fine. But the two big things is it's got to either be in the public domain or under an open license that permits two things, free use and repurposing by others. So free cost, it, you've got to have free access to it. That's important. Second is you have to be able, you the faculty, you the K-12 teachers, you the students have to have the legal rights to modify it to meet your needs. So uh, the Creative Commons no derivatives licenses, that's why they're not OER compliant, because it would violate this ability to repurpose it. Right? You can't change it. The other licenses are, are OK. OK, so when we look at MOOCs on Coursera, and we use this definition, and we look at an all rights reserved copyrighted MOOC, we say, is that OER? Well, is it free? Yep, free. Do you have the legal rights to repurpose it? No, you don't. Therefore, it's not an OER. So here's why legal rights are important. David Wiley, who some of you probably have seen speak or, or know, um, really kind of spelled it out like this. He calls it the five R's. So legally, you must be able, as faculty, as students, as K-12 teachers, to reuse the resource, use it exactly as it is, to revise it, change it, modify it to meet your needs, remix it, take that resource and a little bit over here from that Penn State MOOC and a little bit from this MIT course and a little bit of my own stuff and mash it together and create something new. I must be able to redistribute it. That new thing that I've created, part of his MOOC, part of my stuff, share it out on my blog or my website, share it with the world, and retain. You have to be able to keep a copy of it forever and give it to others to keep forever. Again, we want to stay away from this new model which is being propagated that says lease and then poof, your access goes away. That's not okay for education. Here's another look at the five R's. All right, another thing that uh, faculty oftentimes ask is, well, isn't this going to hurt my academic freedom? If there's, you know, sort of this one really great textbook, am I going to be forced to use it? Or if there's this one really great MOOC, are you not going to need me anymore? And it's, it, we've been talking about this all day. Uh, it's really the opposite. In an age of information abundance, what you need more than anything else are individuals who can find the gems, find the experts, find the right resources, find the right research, the right data, and synthesize it and bring it into the learning space for your Penn State learning environment, whether it's hybrid or online or face-to-face, or -face. because you know what your students need. You know what industries are in Pennsylvania where your students are going to be going into jobs. You know what their own personal family situations are and what support they might need and what they don't. You know what level they're at. So when we took, and I used to work in the Washington State Community Colleges, when we took MIT physics courses, we looked at them and we said, these are really great, but they're not appropriate for community college students. We have to put them at a different level. And so we had to rewrite big chunks of the courses so they were appropriate for our students. We had to be able to revise them. Right? So in fact, OER enhances academic freedom. It gives you the legal rights to modify things to meet your needs. Again, we want to stay away from DRM, digital rights management. We want open licenses where there is no expiration date. And this is the threat, right? You've all seen this movie with uh, Men in Black. Um, you know, this is where the publishers are going. Is oh, you're done reading with that? Poof, there goes your access, right? You're done reading, your access goes away. And, and that's, that's not OK in an age of ubiquity and digital stuff that we can put an open license on. So why does OER matter? matter? All kinds of reasons. Uh, translations, do you have any students at this university where English is not their first language? Just a few, right? Um, it, these people in the back are going, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, right? So in Washington State, our number one langu language is English. Uh, in the community colleges and universities, number two is Spanish. Number three is Vietnamese. Number four is Chinese. 
and we got a lot of students that are coming in that say, gosh, it'd be really helpful if your 100 and 200 level courses as I'm getting acclimated and taking my first couple courses, if the content was not just in English, but was in my native language as well. When something is an OER, anybody on the planet can take it and translate it. So we work with the United Nations and UNESCO and people all around the world. In fact, I'm sending one of my team members with the US State Department to the Middle East next week, and he's gonna travel around five different Middle Eastern nations to do kind of an OER exchange program. So what do we have for OER that they might wanna translate into Arabic? What do they have in OER that we might wanna translate into English? And how do we get their faculty talking with our faculty so that we've got a better exchange and free flow of ideas? And that can happen with open content, not so much with closed content. Accessibility is critical. You've got to have, your stuff's gotta be 508 compliant. You don't have a choice. I guarantee if I started digging around at Penn State, probably 97% of your courses would not meet 100% of the 508 guidelines and you're in violation, you could be sued under the American Disabilities Act. That's a problem. If your content has an open license on it, there are organizations, nonprofits out there like Benetech and Flow out of Canada and CAF who are actually taking OER and revising it so that it is ADA compliant. One of the, th one of the benefits you get about openly licensing your stuff is a global labor force makes your content better for free. That's kind of a neat thing. Another thing, and this is as faculty, they, they care most about these two things, the ability to customize, right? I change it, make it exactly what I want, and affordability. So faculty, put your hands up if your students have ever complained about the high cost of textbooks. Right? It's happened a few times. The, the average cost of textbooks uh, at Penn State, oh good, open textbooks is next. So, so here are the numbers, right? Average amount of students, uh, average students that you're, here at Penn State is spending $1,200 on books and supplies, so supplies are, are worked into this. Just textbooks alone range on the low end between $800, and on the high end can get up around 14 or 1500 if people are pre-med or in different STEM fields, like engineering especially, it can get very, very expensive, right? Uh, textbook costs up 800% in the past 30 years. That's, that's like six times, eight times the consumer price index. Why? Well, because it's, a, it's a fundamentally a busted market and they've been able to do that, right? So, these are a problem. Here's what the here's what the numbers look like. That top line is tuition and fee increase uh, over that time span. Number two, textbooks. The overall consumer price index is way down here. Here's why textbooks are such a problem. It's one of the few markets on the planet where the consumer doesn't get to choose what they're buying. Now think about that for a minute. If I walked up to you and said, "Guess what? You just bought a Honda Accord. I hope you like the car. Give me thirty thousand dollars." He'd be a little upset, right? That's what happens with textbooks. I'm the professor, I make the choice of the book that's in my class, right? Uh, and before last year, the publishers wouldn't even tell me how much the book costs. They don't want me to know how much the book costs. And frankly, as a faculty member, I don't much care. I don't have to buy it. It's not my problem, students have to buy it. It's one of the few marketplaces in the planet where that happens, where the consumer doesn't get to comparison shop and decide what it is they're buying. You have to buy the book that the faculty has assigned if you want to be a full participant in the class. And the reason that uh, the, this is such a problem, I've got to slide it in a minute, is that we know from studies, both in Florida and California, and there's a recent survey as well, that 60 to 70% of all higher ed students in the United States are not buying the resources, at least one resource that you've assigned for your class. So faculty, put your hands up if you've ever had students that have not bought everything you've assigned for your class. Is that a problem? You worked really hard as faculty to design the resources that are gonna help students be successful in your learning space. And if they're not buying, and they don't buy for a lot of reasons, by the way. One is sometimes they don't have the money. Two is they think it's a, just a ripoff uh, because they're sick and tired of going back to your bookstore at Penn State and getting 10 cents on the dollar. Or sometimes your bookstore says, I'm sorry, I just can't buy it back because the versions have changed. And they all, right, all these things happen. And sometimes um, they just, they just don't, uh, they're sick of, and no offense faculty, but I've done this as faculty as well. Uh, as faculty, one of the ways that we remit and we put together what we need for the class is we over consume and subscribe what they need so that we can do our remit. So I, I'll assign you seven books and I'll use just parts of the books that I need to use. And that's how we remix because there's no other way to do it because we can't legally rip out of commercial textbooks what we need and create a course back. That would be violating US copyright. With OER, you can. You just take what you need and you put together exactly what the course back that you want for your students, and you give them that. And if it's OER, the cost is zero. Anybody heard of OpenStax, this project? 
So if you haven't seen this, you should take a look at it. This is coming out of Rice University. Um, Rice has been in the OER business for a decade. They've had their connections repository. They now have a project called OpenStax. Um, they're now up to, they just passed 1,000 faculty adoptions in the US. So these are sometimes department level adoptions. Uh, sometimes they're individual faculty, but they just passed 1,000. Um, they've only been keeping uh, track of savings for about a year now. They've already saved students $30 million in the United States with those 1,000 adoptions, and they're on a J-curve adoption. How much do these books cost? Zero. They're free. What license are they under? Creative Commons Attribution. You can take them. You don't like them? Modify them. Change them. Take parts of them. Don't use them. I don't care. It's up to you. I, mean, I do care. I hope you use them. <laughs> but uh, you can do anything you want with them. What are they building? I mean, look at the title. They're building your 100 level courses. Okay, they're saying, oh, intro to stats? Done. Intro to psych? Done. Calculus? Done. And they're going, their goal is to do the top 25 highest enrolled textbooks. You don't like it, it needs to be changed? Change it, please. Make it better. Modify it. Make a Penn State version of it. They'd love it. Okay. Who's paying for this? Are these any good? These books, are, this project is specifically designed to go head-to-head -head with publisher textbooks and not only be as good as, but be better than. These books are up to date. They're written by PhDs in the field for each one of these. They're, they actually hire a professional textbook writing company that has editors and copy editors and graphic artists and the whole bit. And all these, not all of them yet, but they all will have also iPad versions uh, with their interactive and the stuff moves on the screen and you know really, really nice design. Those uh, cost money. They're $4.99. Still have a CC by license. Okay, so if you want something fancy and you're moving to eBooks, fine. They're five bucks. Probably cheaper than what you use in your class. You don't like them? Change. Okay. Who's paying for this? Foundation. Foundations have looked at the textbook market and said, and said, you know what? That's a problem. In community colleges, textbooks can cost about half of the cost of going to college. So in my state, textbooks are about 40% uh, of the cost of going to community colleges. I just left Hawaii. In Hawaii, they tough duty, I know. But in Hawaii, textbooks cost more than the tuition at community colleges. Textbooks are 55, 60% of a lot of the classes. Is that a problem? Well, if you're in Hawaii, you move to open textbooks, you can go to the legislature, you can go to your president, you can go to your provost, you can go to parents and say, guess what? Community colleges in Hawaii cost just went down by 50%. Does that play well in the press? You bet. At Penn State, you could take your costs of an education down by probably 20 to 25% overnight by moving to open textbooks. Something to look at. Okay, here's all their gaps. Okay, here's the here are the studies I was mentioning. This is a 2012 Florida study. Um, with expensive textbooks, here's what you get. 60% okay, of the students don't buy books. The California survey said 70%. They're taking, half of the students are taking fewer courses because textbook costs are expensive. Do you care at Penn State how fast people get to degree? What's your average? Six years? Five and a half? Right? Am I, am I close? You want to get to four for a bachelor's degree? You bet you do. Right? This is a problem. You got students that are delaying their time to degree because you got expensive textbooks. 31% uh, choose to not register for a course due to a textbook. Some of the more positive data that's coming out on OER adoptions right now is very, very interesting. So uh, administrators in the room, prick your ears up for this. Uh, colleges are actually making more tuition money when a course moves to OER. Anybody know why? Take a guess. What happens to, what? Students are willing to take it, that's true. I'm happy as a student that the course doesn't have any textbook costs, so I'll sign up. But that's not the reason why students were still signing up for the course. But what was happening before week eight? They're dropping. And if the students drop the course, how much tuition does the university get? Zero, right? You give, you give the money back. If, if, during the ad drop period, there's that grace period. Okay, what's happening that we're seeing is when the course moves to OER, specifically to an open textbook, uh, a much higher percentage of students are staying in the course because it, they would have other, they they weren't going to buy the book and they were more likely to drop out because they said I don't think I can be successful in this course because I don't have all the instructional materials I need to be successful in this course. When they walk into a course that has its OER. And the faculty member says to him, hey, welcome to the course. Here are all of the educational resources that I've designed for the course. 
Here they are for you on day one. In fact, I can give them to you before the course starts. You don't have to wait for your financial aid check to show up on you know, the third week of the semester and go to the bookstore to get your stuff. I'm giving you everything on day one, and it's going to cost you nothing. I, I did this because, A, I don't want to charge you a lot of money. I know college is expensive. B, I want you to have everything on day one with everybody else. And C, this is exactly the set of resources I've designed for this course, and I know it's going to help make you successful. To stay in the course. College keeps the tuition, tuition goes. And so now colleges who are doing this are, it's actually a, a perpetual positive loop. The provost, the presidents, the deans are saying, wow, look, when we, when we move to OER, I actually get more tuition money, uh, let's do more of that. And the faculty are saying, hold on a second, what we need is time, right? We need time to redesign our courses, we need some release time. Uh, I normally teach three courses, I need you to let me off one or two of those. I need more time to redesign. I got to go review these open textbooks to see if they're any good. They might need to be modified. All this takes time. And the administration is saying, fine, we'll, we'll give you some time. Because we know that, that it's going to help our students get through faster. We're going to have more successful students. We're going to have better, you know, across our key performance indicators that we track. At the Little project. We run this idea with a project called Kaleidoscope. Very simple project. What if 100% of the students had all their resources on day one? And what if it was all OER? That was, that was the question, the research question. And uh, big surprise, uh, they, they, did, they did really well. Um, I did, oops, I took that slide out. But across every single course where we displaced the original course with open education resources, the, uh, the student outcomes went up, not just on grade, and their, their learning outcomes as measured by the standardized test in the, the course, so all those were held constant, but on other measures as well. The students took more courses, their time to degree went down, their overall debt dropped, all the things, all positive things. So faculty, you should be really worried about this. Right? How are your students supposed to learn with materials that not only they can't afford, but they're not buying? That should worry you as faculty. Okay. Now the way out of that is very simple. So the, you know, this is playing in the press. The press is saying, hey, textbooks are expensive. No big surprise. Um, I would recommend bringing David Ernst here to campus. He'll come on his own dime. He's got a Hewlett grant to do this. University of Minnesota uh, worked with their faculty and said, had the same conversation and said, hey, can we move to open textbooks? And the faculty said, well, we don't have time to go look for them. And so David, who's the CIO of the College of Education, said, well, I'll put together a, an open textbooks catalog. So if you go to Google and type in, uh, University of Minnesota open textbooks. It'll be the first one. And so he went out and he found what he thought uh, were all the high quality open textbooks in different fields. And the faculty said, yeah, but you're a CIO. You know, what do you know? It? You don't know if these are good or not. And David said, well, how are we going to know? And the faculty said, well, we need to review them. He said, okay, what do you need? And they said, well, we need a little time and a little money. He said, okay, here's a little time and here's a little money. Please go do the review. And the reviews are up. So, because faculty trust other faculty, right? They don't trust me. They're going to trust him. They don't trust this guy, even though he's a really nice guy. Um, they trust each other, as they should, right? Physics faculty care what other physics faculty have to say. And so, University of Minnesota, University of British Columbia are two of the big ones right now. They've got these faculty review programs going of open textbooks. And all the reviews are under a CC by license. And so, you can take them and read them. Look at them. And David will come here to Penn State on his own dime, and he'll tell you what they're doing at University of Minnesota. He'll share, um, I don't think I have his stats up here, but he has, he has a professional development, kind of a training thing that goes along with talking with faculty, and it's about two hours long. At the end of that two hours, he's getting like 36% conversion rate, meaning 36% of the faculty that go through his little training move to open textbooks, which is staggeringly high. That's really a big deal. And so they're doing more of it. The Hewlett Foundation saw this and said, oh, that's great. Go teach others how to do that. And so they gave them a bunch of money to go on the road and go teach other you know, Big Ten universities how to do that. So, so bring them in. There's also interesting uh, companies out there that are like Lumen Learning, which are uh, going in because Penn State's biology department, any biology professors? Professors, put your hands up. What do you teach? What do you teach? In the back. Education, okay. So the Department of School of Education here says, Hey, we really like this idea. We want to move to uh, open educational resources and open textbooks for our highest enrolled five courses. We don't know where to start. And we don't know where to find anything. And, and if we're going to build stuff, Creative Commons, yeah, we don't really know how to put CC licenses on our stuff. We need some help. 
So there's new companies like Lumen that are popping up who will come in and you pay them a little bit of money, but the beauty of these guys is that everything they build with you, they put a CC BY license on it. And they, in fact, refuse to take a contract with you if you won't agree to openly license what you collectively build. So it's good for everybody, right? It's good for you because you get some help. It doesn't cost a lot of money. You get to the OER goals that you had. You now have your five courses with open textbooks and OER. And you probably built some new stuff that was specific to what your department said you needed at Penn State that the rest of the world hadn't built yet. Uh, Lumen's happy because they got paid for their services. And when they go down the street to Ohio State, they can legally reuse what they built at Penn State and say, hey, Ohio State, here's some great uh, education resources we built with the School of Education at Penn State. And Penn State's now happy because they see Ohio State's using their stuff and it's changed it, made it better on their dime. And because it's openly licensed, Penn State can have it all back. Right? So some, there's some interesting things happening out there in the marketplace around open, new open business models are emerging. And then you're seeing this happen at department levels as well. So this is a Tidewater Community College. Actually took a whole degree program. It's a um, business administration, I think. Yeah, business administration degree. Uh, it used to cost students about $3,700 in book costs. And they're calling this a Z degree. So it's a zero textbook cost degree. So it used to cost $3,700 in textbook costs. Now textbook costs are zero. Uh, who wants to come to our program? It's a great advertising, right? You got choices among lots of different colleges you could go to. Uh, if you come to Penn State University, your first two years at Penn State, zero textbook cost. You think that's a competitive advantage? You bet it, right? And and that's what uh, a lot of colleges are using it as, as an advertising tool. Um, this was uh, one of the outcomes at Tidewater, where they uh, looked at you know what happened with their developmental math courses in this degree program, and you saw what happened when they moved. The OER. Uh, the, more of this research is being published right now. Uh, Paul, so I'm going to hop into policy here for a minute. I'm okay with that. Governments are taking notice of this and they're providing resources to support this. So California, a couple years ago, said we're going to take five million dollars right out of the state general funds for the production of open textbooks. And and they said uh, the, the the caveat was the money had to be matched. So foundations are now matching that money, and as the money gets matched, it gets released. And California faculty at the universities at Cal State, the UC system, and the community colleges have a committee to decide which courses they want open textbooks for. And as soon as they started this, British Columbia saw this and said, that's a good idea. And now Saskatchewan and Alberta and Idaho and Washington and Utah, we've got a hold of this, this whole kind of pan-Pacific thing going on. Penn State's welcome to join. You'll be kind of the odd duck out. You have to fly up. But you're welcome to come. We meet in British Columbia every year. And uh, the government in British Columbia said, yes, we'll throw several more million dollars on top of that. And everybody agreed on two things. Number one, we're not going to recreate the wheel. If somebody else has built a high quality open textbook and it, and it isn't quite what we want, we're going to modify it, change it to meet our needs. But we're not going to just, we're not going to have, we're not going to build 100 copies of Spanish 101. Right? We're going to have a few copies of Spanish 101 and we're going to spread out. The second thing we're going to agree to do is that everything that we all build as a consortia is under a CC BY license. So as California builds things, CC BY. As British Columbia builds things, CC BY. And the third thing is that we're going to coordinate our activity. So the first thing we did is we all got together in year one, and California said, we're going to build 50 open textbooks. And everybody said, great, which 50? And they listed them out. And we said, well, hold on a second. OpenStax already built those six. And South Africa's Sea of Ula project built those 12. And so of your 50, you know, half of them are already done. Uh, why don't we use those? Why don't we revise those? Why don't we not waste our time? And why don't we, why don't you go build a different 50? And so California said, OK. And then British Columbia said, well, we're going to hold until we know what California does. And we'll build another 40, but we'll build a different 40. All right? So we're coordinating our activities so that collectively, the world has not 50 textbooks, but 200 textbooks across different disciplines. All right? You're welcome to join this if you want. Okay, I, my last job before Creative Commons, I worked in universities for a long time, but then I took a stint for four years in community colleges, uh, which really opened my eyes to a lot of things. Um, one is we had this cultural shift. So a lot of the questions people have been asking me today is, look, I understand the affordances of digital things. I get it. I understand open licensing. It's free. Cool. That's good, too. But how do you convince people to act in new ways? How do you change people's minds, right? How do you get them to change their behavior so that sharing is what they want to do by default and they're not afraid of it.
how do we how do we have conversations at the dean and provost and department chair level so that when people walk into promotion and tenure, if I publish an open access journal, that that's a positive thing and not a negative. That when I share my course under a Creative Commons license, that that's viewed as a contribution and a service component of my portfolio, and that nobody dings me for you know. And I've heard this before in P and D committees. Are you kidding? You put your course under a Creative Commons license? You must be stupid. Now other people are going to steal your stuff, and you're going to get fired, and the university won't need you anymore. That's a negative on your promotion and tenure. We've actually seen things like that, and as opposed to I would say more enlightened P and T committees, which have said that's fabulous. Can you bring data that shows that you know how, how many people have downloaded that course that you shared, that MOOC that you offered under an open license? Not only how many students did you have that engaged in your content, but which other universities around the world took parts of your course and are using it? That that should be a plus on his PNT review, right? Not on me. Right. So so we said, look, we've got some cultural work to do here. We have to move from not invented here to proudly borrowed from there. So not invented here is if I didn't build it, if I didn't build the content for my class, it must be garbage because I'm the only smart person in education psychology on the planet. That's what I used to say. That of course is an arrogant and just wrong thing to say. Of course, there's other smart people out there in the world that are education psychologists. Of course, there are other physicists on the planet. Why do you think CERN is giving away all their stuff and putting it out there? Because they know there's great physicists all over the world. Okay, so that, that that's it's arrogant to think that, and it's a wrong-headed way to think that I'm going to hug my content, hang on to it, hold tight, and that that's what makes me valuable. If you think that content is what makes you valuable as faculty in this world, you are sorely mistaken. Right? What makes you valuable as faculty is your ability to synthesize knowledge, expertise, understand your students' needs, create a learning space that's vibrant and exciting and authentic and leverages not only the technologies and original sources of content, right, but gets students excited about the profession. That's what faculty do well. Content is content. Yes, it matters what you choose. There's lots of different choices, as you know. Okay. Uh, content's not a strategic advantage. Right? It just isn't. Everybody in the world teaches stats 101. People don't decide to come to Penn State University because of the textbook that you've chosen for stats 101. They just don't. And, and we can't afford it anymore. That kind of inefficiency just doesn't fly. This was our, our highest enrolled course in the community colleges. That's how much our students spent every year on one textbook. And we said that's insane behavior. That's not OK. And so we built the open course library. Okay, It's the entire gen ed curriculum. This is what K-12 looks like in my, my state. Right? We spend 130 million bucks a year. These are the results we get. Do you think those are good results? I'm not happy with it. 10 years out of date, faculty, would you ever teach anything that's 10 years out of date? This is what we do. You do this too in Pennsylvania. Your K-12 curriculum on average is 10 years out of date. Is that okay? Not okay. Is it okay that it's paper only? How many kids in Pennsylvania are lucky enough to have digital devices? Lots of them. Okay. Is, it, is it possible that when they're on the bus, they might actually look at something academic on their phone? I agree that's a long shot, but at least we should give them the opportunity. Today we don't. Right? Uh, students can't do anything with their books, right? and then you, teachers can't update it. Okay, you lose the book, the parents have to pay for it. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a lousy thing. So we've got something called the School of Open. I don't have time to go into that. Uh, open policy, very briefly, and then we'll stop and go to questions. Um, open policy basically is the funder requiring that what's produced be open. So if you're the National Institutes of Health, what they have said for five years now is if you take the NIH money, you do the research, within 12 months uh, uh, after publication, you must put a copy of your research article in PubMed Center, in an open access repository. The U.S. Department of Labor just put out a $2 billion grant to U.S. community colleges, said here's $2 billion for the B, with lots of money, go build new academic programs, everything must be under a CC by -life. You don't like those terms? Okay, go take the money. Right? The public paid for this. The public should have access to what it paid for. The Hewlett Foundation just announced two weeks ago the entire foundation, every sector that they fund, global development, education, doesn't matter what it is. If you take money from the Hewlett Foundation, you will put a CC by license on what you do. Don't agree to those terms? That's okay. Go get money somewhere else. Okay, so this is becoming the status quo. Uh, how many people, how many faculty in the room write research articles? Okay, so this should look very familiar, right? This is today's model. Government gives you money, you do the research, you submit the article. When you submit the article, what happens to your copyright? You sign it over, right? You turn it over, you now own nothing, Penn State owns nothing, 
the US government and the public own nothing. The, the journal owns everything, all the companies. Uh, articles are published, mainly in closed access journals, meaning you have to pay for access. Librarians, put your hands up. Library, what do you have to do? Subscribe. How much do journal subscriptions cost? Lots of money, right? Does the public have access? You do if you're at Penn State and you're lucky enough to have access, but I guarantee in the past several years, if he's had budget cuts, he's been cutting journals. Okay, so it's very, very common that a faculty member at Penn State will get a $6 million grant to study prostate cancer, and they will publish in a closed journal, and Penn State, because budget cuts had to cut that particular journal, and it is now against US copyright law for you, the professor who got that $6 million grant, to use your own research in your own class with your students. Is that OK? Because that's the model we got. Okay. Now, the good news is open policies say, keep that whole model, change one thing. So up here in the upper left, all you have to do, if you're the funder, is say, if you take this money, you will openly license what you built as a condition of the funding. This is not optional, it's required. You take this foundation money, you take this government money, you will share what you built. Everything else is the same. Go do whatever research you want to do. Go publish wherever you want to publish. After, and we'll even let you have an embargo period. You know, publish where you want, even in a closed journal, but 12 months after publication, you got to share it, right? And better yet, the article and the data are open. Data should be under CC0 in the public domain. Article should be under a CC license so people can actually data mine those articles and make derivative works of them. Okay, public can download them. Why? Because they, they're open. By the way, uh, your articles that you're publishing in closed journals get read on average less than three times. That is the average number of reads for new articles. Average number of reads for open access journals, 45 times, 15 times as much. Do you care about that as an author? Do you want to be read? Probably. Why did you do the research in the first place? You want to change the world, right? You want to spread knowledge. You want to affect other people's thinking. Uh, it doesn't happen if people can't get access to it. Public now has full reuse rights. What happens to science? What happens to ed psych? What happens to different fields? Well, no big surprise if people can read it, the field can move forward faster. This is what CERN is doing. CERN is saying, we want to figure out particle physics. This is it's really hard. There's a lot of data. We're going to open this up and let anybody on the planet that's got expertise contribute and move this forward. So, uh, so this is what's happening. The White House has issued an executive order to all the agencies. That's done. Labor did its $2 billion thing. California Community College has just issued a directive saying everything CC BY that comes out of discretionary funds. This is the main point. Publicly funded resources ought to be openly licensed. We just helped launch a network called the Open Policy Network, which is, uh, which is helping governments and foundations do this. And we la we're launching an institute for open leadership where we're bringing in leaders from around the world to teach them how to implement open policies in whatever sector. With that, let's turn it over to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cable. Um, that was uh, a lot of information. And uh, if I could just give you one public speaking um, uh, tip, if you would. I think you need to show a little more passion as you're speaking for your topic. Uh, really, I mean, you just get people on fire about this. It's great stuff. So um, we have a few questions that came over uh, online, and I've got one uh, posed for you, but we'd also like to hear from the community here, uh, both online and, and uh, in the room. So one question was, if I download a course and I make a derivative work of it, and my students now contribute to it, at what point does it become a different kind of a work First question. Second question is, it, am I obligated to return that back to some repository in order to be then shared and, and so forth? Yeah, great question. So, so uh, copyright law says that uh, if you make a substantive change to a work, now that's a fuzzy gray definition, right? So, um, you know, if, if I'm taking a textbook and I change two sentences in one chapter, is that a substantive change? Probably not. If I rip out chapter two and write a new chapter two, is that a substantive change? Yeah, most people would say it is. Uh, where CC licensing comes into play around derivative works really is with, um, with providing attribution and with the share alike clause. So, well, and, and, and with no derivatives as well. If it says no derivative, you can't make derivative works, so that's important. Of course, in education, we want to stay away from the no derivative license because as educators, we change stuff. That's what we do. Um, let's say that you took a Wikipedia article, 
and your class wanted to update and change it. A share alike clause on the Wikipedia article demands that your derivative work be licensed under the same terms. So let's say you change Wikipedia, it's relicensed under the same terms. Let's say that you took an OpenStack textbook that's under a CC BY license. What if you rip out a chapter of OpenStack, you know, chapter two of OpenStack, and you write a new one? What's your obligation there? Because it's CC BY and there's no share alike on it, um, I actually could, that, um, that new chapter could be licensed any way I see fit. I could, but what I still have to do is provide attribution to the other chapters of the book. So if, if my new work is the old OpenStack textbook minus their chapter two with my new chapter two in it, what I have to do in terms of attribution is I have to say the original work was OpenStax, here's the link back to them, it's under a CC BY 4.0 license, here's the title of the book. So that's the proper attribution. And then I also have to say, and I changed chapter two. So chapter two is new, and here's the license I put on chapter two. Now the best practice and what the community likes to see, when I say the community, I mean open education to people around the world, what they like to see is the, the same license used or a more permissive license. So if it's CC BY and OpenStax, it's really nice if you also put a CC BY license on your chapter two, but you don't have to. You could, you could leave it all rights reserved copyright. You could put it in the public domain. There's all sorts of things you can do with your text. Second question was? Uh, <laughs> second question was, uh, I don't know, I can't remember. Um, so let, let's go to the group here. Maybe it'll come back to me. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much for that presentation. I want to come, can you come back to that uh, slide you had about the publishing model that we currently have in academia? Yeah. You bet. Um, the reason I'm asking about that is because at one point in the slide, yeah, right there, uh, it's really when you move from the copyright to the closed access journals. And the closed access journals, a large part of how they maintain a lot of their power right now is the prestige factor. Yeah. Um, and the impact uh, that a lot of these journals have. And a lot of institutions. Uh, directly or indirectly foster moving towards closed access journals because of the PNT process. Yeah. Uh, do you know of any institutions which actually moved away from that and how have they done that? Yeah, so the main way that institutions are moving away from that is the faculty, usually through the faculty senate, are taking a vote, an open access vote. And so, uh, so Harvard faculty have done this, Yale's done this. Uh, the, the website to look at is uh, Roar Map. It's R-O-A-R-M-A-P. Let me just pull that up real quick. R O A R M A P. So if you go to Roar Map, what you'll see, let me make this a little bit bigger. What you'll see is a listing of all of the open access policies at institutions around the world. And you can see you know, how they've changed over time. And they've got uh, funder mandate open access policies in here. They've got multi institutional policies like system level mandates. They've got institutional mandates. That would be if the faculty at Penn State took a vote. And they've got sub-institutional, which is usually departmental. So the math department at Penn State or the College of Education took a vote. And usually what faculty are voting on themselves, so it's a, and this is a nice way to go about it, right? Because nobody's imposing this on faculty. This is the faculty as the faculty senate saying to themselves, we as faculty think it's that the point of academic research is to share knowledge and that the current system is not properly facilitating that main goal. The current system is actually closing up knowledge in commercial proprietary journals which are taking publicly funded research and locking it up and the public doesn't have access to what they paid for and that's a problem. And even we the universities which are the authors of this research more and more our libraries through budget cuts and other choices they're making are not able to subscribe to all of the high quality peer reviewed journals that we would like to see. In fact, last year Harvard put out a communique from its libraries that said, even we Harvard can no longer afford in our library budget uh, all the journals that our faculty want and we're cutting journals as well. Right? So if Harvard can't afford it, my guess is that the community colleges of the world are in real trouble. Right? So the faculty are getting together and sort of having this philosophical debate right, and discussion. What comes at the end, and you can see, all the policies around the world are linked from this website. Uh, the faculty are essentially saying, uh, we the faculty will choose what research we do. That's our choice. 
We, the faculty, will choose where we publish, what journals we publish in. That's our choice as well. Uh, however, after 12 months of publishing, wherever it is we publish. Now, some of us believe strongly that we should be publishing in open access journals. And when we publish, it's immediately available. And that's a personal choice. But as a faculty, what we're committing to is that within 12 months of publication, so even if I publish in the journal in JAMA, right, Journal of American Medical Association, which is, to my knowledge, not an open access journal, um, and a very expensive one at that. But even if I pu publish in JAMA, because I'm in the College of Medicine here at Penn State, 12 months after publication in JAMA, I reserve the right, as the researcher, to put a copy of my article in an open access repository. Now, what do you call it here at Penn State? Your scholar sphere. So here at Penn State, you have scholar sphere, which is for that purpose. So the faculty in your college of education, so, so I would recommend your faculty senate at Penn State have this conversation and take a vote. But if that's not going to fly, then maybe the faculty in the college of education could have that conversation and call a vote of, of your faculty. And then you simply make this decision as faculty. Now, the beauty of that is that that gives you great power as individuals with the journal. So if you go to the journal, so when Harvard faculty today, for example, go to a journal, go to JAMA, and they do, they publish in JAMA like crazy, right? Their, their School of Medicine does. They go to JAMA and they say, um, within 12 months of publication JAMA, we will put a copy in the Harvard Open Access Repository. Now JAMA can say, no, we don't accept those terms. And then Harvard faculty say, fine, you will not get our research, right? And JAMA has said, OK, we changed our mind. We'll take your research and your terms, and we'll allow you to publish. Uh, and now, the other thing that faculty need to do, and this is very important, is faculty need to not turn over their copyright to JAMA or Nature or any other journal that you're publishing to. Don't do it. Because the moment you turn over your copyright, it's gone forever. They do not have to give it back to you. And if they have the copyright, in the eyes of the law, it doesn't matter what your open access policy says at Penn State, they hold the copyright. So uh, here's something else you need to look at. It's called the SPARC Author Agreement. So SPARC, S-P-A-R-C, Author Agreement. If you go to Google and just type in uh, Author Addendum, it's called. It's called the SPARC Author Addendum. And what this is is a nice little template that you can download and put your name on it, the title of your article. And when you turn in your journal article, you attach this to it. Basically, what this says is, hey, journal, I give you a non-exclusive copyright, non-exclusive, to publish my article and keep it and retain it forever. And it's perpetual and worldwide. You can do whatever you want with my article. But I, the faculty member, also keep non-exclusive copyright over my article, which means I can do whatever I want with it. Right? So that, and then you tell, and then in good faith, you say to JAMA or wherever you're publishing, um, uh, I, I will. I promise JAMA that I will not publish this anywhere else for a period of 12 months because that's what my the faculty here at Penn State have agreed to. But after 12 months, I will put it in our open access repository or somewhere else. Now you can go that route. That's called green open access. Green meaning you put a copy in your institutional repository or some other repository. There's another model called gold open access, which essentially is you pay a publication fee to the journal to make your article open immediately. They put a Creative Commons license on it. Now, some of the traditional for-profit journals are allowing this. They're saying, OK, you want your article to be open? Pay us $1,000. and We'll open your article right now, because that's how much money we're going to lose by you know, making your article open. And what funders are now doing is they're saying to you, OK, here's a $6 million grant. Go do you know, pancreatic cancer research. Um, and in your budget, Write in what you think the application fees are going to be for publishing the open access journal. Oh, you're going to need $10,000? Fine. Write that into your budget. And that way the faculty has the control and the money to say, I'm going to keep the copyright. I'm going to choose what journal I publish to. If I publish to an open access journal or a proprietary journal that's going to charge a, a publishing fee, I, I've got the budget to do it. And there's going to be a Creative Commons license on my work right away. And I'm going to have open access to it. And that complies with the vote that the faculty took here at Penn State for my work to be Does that make sense? And by the way, other universities that have passed these votes are happy to help come and talk with Penn State about why they did that and how they did it and what documents they produced with the Faculty Senate. And you know, people are happy to share it.
Okay, thank you for that question, and, and thanks for the response, Cable. Other questions? Um, I'm kind of curious a little bit from our Penn State community. How do you think this plays in our environment? How do you think our faculty respond, uh, our administration respond? What's the, um, what are the implications for us? Any thoughts? So you know my technique. If I don't get a response, then I look at people in the eye and say, Kyle, what do you think? Or, do you want to try it? I think, uh, like anything else, it depends on you know the program, the department, the individual. I think a lot of people are interested in doing that. Uh, I think that Cable covered a lot of the, the right territory and that we need to change promotion and tenure uh, policies so that publishing in open journals is, uh, you know, gives you as much status as publishing in other places that have, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of backwards that the high status journals are the ones where you're least likely to get accepted, right? So you try that, so you lose a year anyway, or right. often trying to, yeah. <laughs> but so I think the idea of, uh, you know, I think this would resonate with a lot of people. I know, I haven't met a faculty member yet who thinks it's not crazy that publicly funded research ends up going into journals that people have to pay to get. Uh, and I haven't met a faculty member yet who wouldn't like to see more people access her or his, you know, a work. So I think it, I think it resonates well. I think that uh, money does make a big difference to institutions and, and to publishers, and it is an uphill battle. But I, I uh, applaud those of you, you and David Wiley, and the others who are fighting this good fight. And I, I hope we will be able to uh, uh, provide some energy in that direction. Great. We're happy to work with you. Anthony, any thoughts? Or you, I know you always got the, your, your brains going. We just have to tap into it. So uh, I guess I'll just talk to the Penn State perspective a little bit. In the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences, um, we've had quite a lot of our online courses are open educational resources now for like eight years. Um, and I run a program in geography that I guess uh, 28 out of the 30 classes we offer are completely OER. Um, and that's that started with my predecessor who fought <laughs> hard to make that possible. And he was watching what was happening in MIT and other places at the time. It's been a real benefit for us. People discover our programs that way all the time. Um, it has not been a liability. It really resonated with me when you're talking about the fact that content is not the thing that, <laughs> that actually, people actually pay you a lot of money for here. They don't. It's a myth. They, they, they come here because of you as an instructor, as your ability to teach people. Uh, content's everywhere, all over the place. And we're becoming curators anyway. Um, that's what we're good at. So I, I, I would encourage you to try it. Uh, open up some things, see what happens. It's not hurt our enrollments, it's actually made enrollments happen because people find us that way. Um, organic search works a lot better than keyword stuff. So, uh, and your classes being out there provides a lot of eyeballs on what you do. So there's a quality aspect that really plays to our favor. Uh, a lot of people are skeptical about online learning, of not, not here in Penn State, but outside of Penn State. And the fact that we could show students before they take anything exactly what we're going to teach and how we do it is incredibly important and usually blown away that we're willing to put ourselves in the line like that. So it's helped us ensure quality to show our quality. So it's a good thing. That's a really it. important point. Uh, we were talking on the way over here. Uh, MIT just hit its 10th anniversary of Open Courseware. So they've uh, all 2,100 courses at MIT are online under a Creative Commons license. Penn State could download the entire MT MIT curriculum anytime you want. Your, and MIT is happy to give it to you. Uh, so MIT did, did a big study at 10 years and asked a bunch of questions. You know, how many? They had over a billion downloads of their content. And one of the interesting, lots of interesting factoids, but the most interesting to me was their admissions office always have, has asked uh, applicants why they chose MIT, why they chose to apply to MIT. Uh, because there's other options, right? There's, if, you, if you're uh, going into engineering, there's Caltech and there's Georgia Tech. There's Penn also State. Other, other good options. And there's Penn State. Um, and uh, I think it was like 30% of MIT uh, applicants said the reason they chose MIT over those other institutions was that they could actually see the curriculum in advance. They could, it's kind of like, you know, you wouldn't buy a car if you couldn't go test drive the car. And students really liked test driving the MIT curriculum. And they also liked that the videos of the MIT faculty were up there so they could see these really great instructors. Well, of course, every university has really great instructors, but not every university shares that openly. So that, how is a high school student to know? Right, so that, that's, that's really important. The other thing that you said, which I wanted to build on a little bit, is that OER and open access 
really isn't that much different from what faculty have always done, right? Faculty are educators, first and foremost. They, they intuitively understand that education is about sharing. They understand intuitively that academic research and writing articles is about spreading knowledge and new ideas and testing hypotheses. And it's about those works being read all over the world. Faculty have always gone to conferences to get ideas from other people and resources and integrate them into their class. Uh, K-12 teachers have always done the same thing. So OER and, and, and OA aren't really that radical if you think about it. Uh, the only difference is, is that we're just being intentional about copyright law and being intentional about license so that our activities, uh, that others using your works are legal and made explicit and known, right? And that's really it. Um, the, the, um, the reason that's important, so in some places in the world where we go, people say, that doesn't matter. So for example, if I was in sub-Saharan Africa, any place except South Africa, South Africa tends to comply more with copyright law. But most of the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa says, Cable, we could, you know, we just don't care about copyright. We steal what we want, but we don't have a lot of money. We just take it, we make copies. We just so why do we care about Creative Commons license? Right? And so I mean, a, it's, I would say, well, that's a problem. You're not complying with the law of the land, and you probably should. You're a citizen of the country. So we have that conversation. Um, but for most of the rest of us, we do care about the law. And given that you can take stuff from anywhere in the world, it's important to be legal uh, in our activities. Yeah. Mr. Cable, I think we have uh, time for maybe two quick questions. One is from our online guest who asks, if, um, let's say our faculty senate either doesn't embrace the idea or, or doesn't act upon it, do individual faculty members still have the option of how they exercise open access privileges? Yes, yeah, so, so it's a great question. And somebody correct me if this is uh, wrong. Larry and I were talking on the way over. I asked, what, are the, what does the contract say at Penn State when faculty create something in the course of their employment? And I've been told that there, this is a recent conversation and change and that the net result of that new policy is that what the faculty at Penn State produce in the course of your employment is the faculty have full uh, copyright over that and the university also has non-exclusive copyright over it. Is that accurate? Okay. So, so that, and by the way, that, congratulations. That's really an ideal contractual situation because in the faculty, if they leave or want to do something with their content, they've got the legal rights to do it. And if they leave, the university can, you know, hand your course to the next new incoming faculty member and say, hey, you might want to use this. So it's good for everybody. What that means in terms of open licensing, to answer your question, is yes, the individual faculty member at Penn State, because you have a bundle of copyright, you have non-exclusive copyright over everything you're building, it, the copyright holder can put a, an open license on their work. So if, if you're in the College of Education and you say, gosh, I kind of like this stuff, I'd like to try an open textbook, or I've got some content that I think is particularly good that I've created that I'd like to share with the world, if you have copyright, which it sounds like you do, then you don't have to ask anybody's permission. You can just put a CC license on it, share it tomorrow. Um, even better, have a departmental-wide conversation about maybe the, uh, the College of Education can look at your highest enrolled 25 courses and try to knock off the textbook costs in there and think about sharing some of the curriculum you develop and using others. Even better, have a university-wide conversation you know, along these lines. Um, so. You know, I guarantee in every, in the president's office, in the provost's office, in your deans, all these people have something they call innovation funds or something like that, right? There's discretionary small pots of money that can be swayed one way or the other depending on what the theme is of the year. Uh, uh, this, this series is very similar, right? You, you give out uh, significant amounts of money for research grants and you have different themes every year. Uh, my advice to you on that is to slap an open policy on those discretionary grants. So uh, out of COIL, I'm going to put the screws in Larry here. Uh, COIL in the future should say, here's the theme for this year. We're going to study whatever it is, student privacy this year. I'm making that up. Um, but Larry could say, uh, we're, uh, it's these are research grants. And so we'll give you faculty the research. Faculty, you decide what you want to do for the research, publish where you want, et cetera. But uh, if, it's academic, if it's an academic article, 12 months after publication, because COIL's the funder, they get to write the rules, right? 12 months after publication, 
you got to put a copy in the, the library's open access repository. And if you're producing educational content or professional development materials or a course or a textbook or if it's content, uh, that, that has to have a CC by license. And if you don't like those terms, that's okay. But nobody at the university is forced to apply for a COIL grant. And I would recommend to your deans and your provosts and your president that they put the same requirement on discretionary stuff. Now, I want to emphasize the word discretionary. This is, I'm not suggesting that Penn State should go 100% open and that the administration should say to the faculty, hey, faculty, we own everything you build. We've had that discussion, and we're going to put a CC by license on everything you build at the university. I think that would be a mistake. You're just going to upset a whole lot of people, right? And so. Uh, uh, but the, the, on the discretionary funds is a really good place to start because it's optional money. And so you don't upset anybody, right? But, but, but the other important thing of putting an open policy on discretionary funds is that the administration, the deans, COIL, and others are sending a very clear signal to faculty and staff and students that openness matters. And so what I would do with Larry, if I can convince Larry to do this, is we would put you know three or four bullet points on Coil's website that say uh, we believe open is a good thing. Here's why we think open uh, open access research is important. Here's why we think Creative Commons licensing is important on works that Coil funds because we want everybody at Penn State to be able to use it and revise it and remix it to meet their. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your uh, presentation today. Um, a couple points. One is that. Uh, I think you made a very good point that if we do not take responsibility for looking at student costs, sometimes the government will, and their recommendations sometimes are not the ones that we would like. <laughs> sure. Um, second of all, for our conversation this morning, is the president here is looking very closely at cost to degree, and the, in fact, on Monday at press at the provost office, we can talk about the cost of textbooks and reducing them. But I think your strategy of really bringing closer to the faculty center is a really unique strategy. Uh, but my question is, if, if you came back in five years and we asked you to make a similar presentation, can you kind of project what you think of, what the uh, environment will be in five years? Yeah, I think if I came back in five years, which I'm happy to do, uh, if I came back in five years, uh, you're going to see uh, almost ubiquitous open policies on all major funding out of the US government. And so we would not be having a conversation about whether or not open policy is a good thing or not. Uh, all of your faculty would have experienced funding requirements uh, from the U.S. federal government that required that what they produced was open. And that would be the status quo. That's, that's happening now uh, and faster than we ever anticipated, which is why we've spun up the Open Policy Network, because it was overwhelming my team at Creative Commons. We couldn't respond fast enough to ministers of education around the world who want to implement open policy. It's an all-hands-on-deck right now. UNESCO is in the field around the world. The Commonwealth of Learning, which is kind of the former British Empire, is everywhere helping governments with open policies. Creative Commons is all around the world. Our Europe team just held, held a meeting in Portugal last week. There's five countries in Europe want to go this way. The European Commission is going this way. So that's one thing. Open policies are going to happen. Uh, so you might as well move to open because the funding is going to push you to open. So that's one thing. Um, I think another thing is that there will be um, uh, open stacks today is at what, what, eight textbooks, I think. I think you're going to see publisher grade uh, open textbooks for the top 100 or 150 courses that are taught enrollment wise in the world. So every high enrollment course you have here is going to have multiple options of open textbook and curriculum that are of you know, the highest quality with CC by licenses on them. And if, if uh, I think you're going to be having very serious conversations, not just about whether or not you should adopt and modify and use those open textbooks, but you're going to be having really hard conversations. You should be having these now, by the way, um, with thinking about the, the valuable time of faculty. So faculty tend to be, this varies by institution, but tend to be a third, a third, a third. They're usually a third teaching, a third research and, uh, and prepping for courses and stuff, and a third committee work and other duties associated with peer reviewing journal articles and stuff like that. Uh, and if you think about the third that is, uh, or part of the third that is about preparing for the class or revising curriculum, et cetera, um, how, many, uh, how much of that is redundant work at Penn State that might be more efficient if it was shared more transparently? Now, I want to be very clear here. I'm not advocating for uh, mandated top-down curriculum that is 
ubiquitous and of one source like the University of Phoenix does or uh, Western Governors University does. I'm not suggesting that at all, so I want to be very clear. What I am suggesting is that uh, when I worked at the Community Colleges of Washington, we asked questions like, how many preps are happening tomorrow for Statistics 101? And the answer across our system was 220. Right, so there were 220 faculty across the 15,000 faculty in the Washington Community Colleges who were prepping for Stats 101. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Our second question that was, are any of those people talking to each other? And the answer was yes, a little bit within the, the same department at the same college, but not across colleges. And certainly there were no system level conversations. And so is that, is that efficient? I don't want to, we don't want to tread on academic freedom. We also want to be smart if we're thinking about costs, and if a third in the community colleges, more than a third of their time is spent prepping course materials. And so would it be smarter, better, or would the faculty be happier if there was better sharing, maybe even a discussion about, you know, hey, gosh, maybe there's five really good open textbooks and we can select from, and let's collectively update those five and all agree to pull from those or, or modify them somehow. And so instead of a third or 40% of my time, Time. Now I can reduce my course prep time to 20% and I can spend 20% more time with students and mentoring and career counseling and helping them think about becoming professionals in the field that they're going into. Is, is that my happier as faculty doing that kind of work than, than what I used to do? Those are the types of conversations that will be coming. And if you're not having those now in five years, those are going to be hitting you right in the face. Um, so I would start having those now. Um, the other big thing which we were talking about at breakfast is uh, data is going to be, uh, it should, it's, it's hitting you now. You're starting to think about uh, the use of data for customized learning pathways. You're starting to think about uh, who owns the data. Does the university own it? Does the vendor own it? Or the system that you've licensed? Um, does the student own their data? Um, have you had conversations with students when they enter Penn State that they're going to produce lots and lots of content data while they're here? and that you, the university, want them to know that they are the copyright holders, which they are, by the way, but we don't treat them like they are, uh, and we don't honor their copyright in any way, shape, or form. Uh, uh, faculty violate students' copyright all the time just because we always have and haven't thought about it. Uh, is that okay? Do we? And the reason that's important is, and this is another big change that's coming, is we want students to be co-creators of knowledge with us. Uh, lots of Big Ten universities have uh, student research programs, so undergrad research programs where the students are doing research with the faculty. You probably have that here too. That's very exciting. The reason that's such so exciting is that's authentic work, right? I'm, I'm learning as I'm doing. I'm actually contributing to the field. Well, you can do that in the classroom if you're, if you're using open content because the students then have license to make chapter two better. They have the license to go out and do original research that then becomes part of the curriculum that's going to affect their cohort and future cohorts. And that's just as exciting as going out and doing research with that. And so that, I, I hope, is the norm in five years. I wish it was the norm when I went to college. I sat in way too many row, rows you know, like this, listening to somebody up front tell me stuff and not, not contributing. And that wasn't very engaging. Okay, Kate, but we're going to draw this portion of the program to a close. Please uh, extend your gratitude toward uh, Cable for a stimulating conversation.